Hello world, this is Craig. This is the SBC85, which is a 8085-based single board computer. So all you have to do is plug power to it, 5 volts, connect this up to a terminal or a terminal emulator, and you can start cranking right away. One of the disadvantages of this board is the 2732 EEPROMs that it used. It has two sockets, one on the board for a base EEPROM that starts at zero, and one for the expansion EEPROM that starts wherever the base ends at, at uh, 1000. The problem with the 2732 is that, well, first of all, it doesn't have a lot of memory space, but the biggest problem is that it requires 21 volts to program. And most programmers now just can't do the 21 volt programming pulse that's required by the 2732. And when I first laid this board out, I just didn't think that I was physically going to have room for a couple of EEPROMs here, particularly one in the ZIF socket for anything bigger than the 2732. But I went ahead and started this board from scratch with the layout and went with a little finer pitch on the trace spacing and, uh, and was able to get a pair of 28 pin sockets on this. So this is a, again, a base socket for starting at 0000, and then an expansion socket for the expansion EEPROM. You can see these boards, they look very much alike. They're almost identical. They both have the 8085. They have an 8155 that gives us 22 pins of I.O., as well as a internal timer and 256 bytes of RAM. We have a 6264, which is a 64 kilobit RAM. We have the address decoding, a little barrel connector here for 5 volt input, and a RS-232 on this DB9 with a MAX-232 to communicate with a terminal or a terminal emulator. So all you have to do is connect a terminal to this, connect 5 volts, and put software in the EEPROM and you're ready to go. Now, what we were able to do with this version 2 of the board is we have these as universal sockets. And, you know, a nice thing about the EEPROMs, if we take a little bit of an aside, here's some EEPROMs. This is the very first EEPROM. This is the 1702. This is the 1702A. And the next one that came out was the 2708. And these are in pretty much a different category because they require, uh, you know, plus and minus 5 volts and 12 volts for the 2708 just to read it. And the same with the 1702. I think the voltages on the 1702 were the same. But nonetheless, these are not just a strictly 5 volt chip. Where everything after the 2708, so the 2716, 32, 64, 128, 256, are all just a straight 5 volt chip. So when they came out with the 2732, they looked back at the 2716. You can see these are in the same package. So these are both 24 pin packages. And they made the pin out of the 2732 the same as the 2716, except for the additional address line that's required by the 2732. Then when they came out with the 2764, they looked at these two guys and they said, well, let's make the pin out the same, but we have to go up to a 28 pin package but for the lower pins let's make those identical so in other words except for pins one and two once we get to pin three the function is the same as it is in the 2716 and the 2732 so what that means is that we can create a universal site where as long as we bottom justify this all of the pins on any of these chips are the same if we if we look them up in the the data sheet to see what that particular pin does in that same location that does the same thing. Now there are a couple of exceptions. You know, for each each time we go up here, we have to have one more address line. And so some things like the voltage on the 2716 and the 2732 become an address line in the 2764. So there is a little bit of tweaking that has to go on, but in general, we can have a universal site that can take any of these EEPROMs. And in fact, it's so universal that you know, for some things, we can even put in this 6264 RAM, and the pinout is exactly the same. So if you ever look at something like a 6264 or a 27256, and you say, why is this pinout so weird? Go all the way back down to the 2716, and that's why the pinout was originally defined. So what that means is on this board, we can use these universal sockets, and we can put in, so for example, this is a 2732, we can put it in that socket, and it will read it as long as we have this bottom justified. So we'll have these unused pins at the top, and 
in the socket, what starts out as pin 3 is actually pin 1 in the 2732. But you can look at this table, and this is from an Intel uh, memory design guide from the early 80s, I think. And it shows us that if we have these different EPROMs and they're bottom justified, these are the functions of those pins for each of the various EPROMs. So back on this version 2 of the board, all we have to do to take care of the little bit of tweaking that has to be done to use any of these is we have two jumpers up here. And these two jumpers then do the little things like move the uh, VCC from pin 24, when we're using the 2732, up to whatever address line that happens to be. And, you know, there's just a little bit of tweaking that can be done with just these two jumpers for these two sockets. Okay, now the limitation on this board, whatever EEPROM we're going to use, we have to use the same in both sockets. Now it wasn't, there's not a technical limitation to that. There was basically just a limitation to how much we could fit on this board because of the address decoding. So while these two jumpers up here, uh, which are a three pin position, it either goes high and it either goes in the top two, the bottom two, or the jumpers removed. These are to define what these two sockets are, either 2732, 2764, 128, or 256. These two jumpers over here, which are one of four jumpers, so it has a common in the center, and the jumper would either be up or to the right, down or to the left, like it is in this case, that defines the address decoding for these two sockets. The reason we wanted to do that was no matter what EPROMs we put in here, so if we have a pair of 2732s or 27128s or whatever, we want the address to be contiguous. So this always starts at zero, and then this socket always is the address right above where this socket ends. So for example, if these are both 2732s, this socket goes from zero to zero FFF, and then this socket takes over at one zero zero zero. If these are 27128s, this one starts at zero and goes up to three FFF, and then this one starts at four zero 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 and goes up to seven FFF. Now there is one more little caveat, and that is that we limited this board to having 32K. So we can use two 27128s, each of them 16K, or if we want to use a 27256, we only use one and we put it in the expansion socket. If you're writing code and you want to use a 27256, then you wouldn't use this socket. The address decoders create the zero starting address in the expansion socket. I mean, if you're, go if you're going to use, if, if you can only use one of the two sockets, you might as well use the ZIF because it's easier to update. Okay, so that is the version 2 of the SBC85. Uh, we already have it available on Tindy for the first few copies that have come out, and then we're going to come back and get gold fingers and a tapered or a chamfered edge on that and uh, uh, make that more readily available. If you happen to want to upgrade from version 1 to version 2, when you're doing the software, you need to change the address of the RAM because on this board, I'm sorry, on this version 1, the, uh, the RAM starts at... 2000, but on version 2, the RAM has to start up at 8000, which is at the top of that 32K uh, base boundary. So you would have to reassemble or recompile your code to move the RAM up. And I think other than that, if you were to, if you were to want to build the version 2 board, most of the components, there might be a gate here that is different, but most of the components will switch over to uh, from version 1 to version 2. Along the same lines as these two SBCs, we have a new little board here. This is a, a prototype version of it. And this is a memory expansion board uh, for the same SBC85. And what we can see is we have four sockets here. And each of these four sockets are individually addressable for an, a memory chip. And so in this case, we can put in a 6264 RAM, just like this one over here on the SBC85. Or these can be EEPROMs. So again, these can go from the 2732 up to the 27256. In uh, any of these four slots, each of these are individually addressable. So, you know, we can have 128K of memory if we want to go with all EEPROMs on this, or we can have 32K of RAM on this if we wanted. So we can really load this board up with a lot of good stuff uh, if we want. And uh, it's a very universal board. It allows us to, as I said, have each of these banks 
in their own address space. So that allows you to fill any holes that might be created in the program in the hardware from the version one or uh, the version two. So you can you can have this memory wrap and fill up any of the holes that are in the rest of the system. Okay, so this is in the prototype. We're running this now and, and we've checked it out with all of the various EPROMs and on this. So we are, uh, we're getting close to submitting this uh, to make the next version. All right, well, that's what I wanted to show you today was this version two of the SPC 85. It's very convenient for those people that don't have a programmer that can program a 2732. And then this is something else to look forward to if you have a need for a lot of memory that you want to add to this system. Uh, you know, we can have 32K on this, 32K of EEPROM, uh, you know, plus the RAM. And then this one can have 128K of memory. So, you know, you can have a lot of memory on this system. All right, that's all I had to show you today. If you have any questions, let me know. I appreciate you watching. Talk with you later. Bye-bye.